the ILERA Congress. Uh, the title of the session is Company Level, Com uh, Company Level Collective Bargaining and the Dynamics of Inequity, Australia, Canada, Denmark, and France in Comparative Perspective. Uh, so we have 90, 90 minutes to, to cover all the uh, all the, 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 this presentation. Uh, my name is Patrice Jalette. I will chair and also I will, I will present in the session. Uh, Sunday Turki is, the, is in charge of all the technical uh, aspect of the presentation. So um, I, th I, I don't know if we win, but we, we should be close to the session who's covering uh, the, uh, the, the, the biggest time zones. So, uh, Good evening, Root. Root will present on uh, Australia. Uh, good afternoon to Elodie and Camille, who will present on France. Uh, good, <laughs> good afternoon to uh, also to Anna and uh, and Sting, uh, who is uh, they, they are on uh, the uh, Danish research team, and to all the other, uh, including my colleague uh, Melanie Laroche. Uh, Good morning. So uh, after introducing the, this international research project that links together, that binds together these, uh, these presentations today, uh, I will leave the floor to colleagues who will have between 12, 15 minutes each to present their national illustrative example of inequity in unionized sit setting. So I'm going to uh, share my presentation. Is it okay? Uh, all right. So uh, this is a research, uh, international research effort with, that is still in progress. Uh, we are nine researchers from four countries, Australia, Canada, uh, mean Quebec, uh, Denmark, and France. Uh, and this research project project is funded by the Industrial Relations and Firms Competitiveness Chair located at the ESCP Business School, l'Ecole Supérieure de Commerce de Paris. So, uh, the research objective of this, pre, uh, of this uh, project is to study forms of inequity in unionized setting across the four countries, and more specifically, the role of collective bargaining in creating, maintain, maintaining, uh, reducing, or avoiding these uh, inequity. Uh, we try to we, we we want to see if uh, collective bargaining could be a, a cause a cause of inequity or a solution to inequity. Uh, another way to to figure that the, the research question we are we, we want to see if collective bargaining is uh, helping to avoid inequity, to reduce it, to create it, or maintain it. And of course, uh, it all depends on the starting point. The research background. So uh, we are at the, uh, an Industrial Relations Association Congress. Uh, equity the, 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 is a uh, what was a, a, a fundamental value in our in our field, uh, equity that we define as fairness in the employment relationship. It encompasses equitable minimum uh, minimum labor standard, fair work rewards, non discrimination policy, protection against uh, uh, unjust dis dismiss dismissal, and so forth and so forth. So, and in the uh, Industrial relation literature, uh, trade unions, and collective bargaining are generally seen as main vehicles for ensuring equity in the workplace. In the last decades, many examples of the there are many examples of the difficulties of collecting of collecting bargaining and also uh, of the unions to assure equity and equitable outcomes for the workers. Just think about the replacement of a permanent labor force with a disposable one, uh, equal pay uh, for equal work that is replaced with two chief compensation structures, laying a permanent employee and so forth. And we observe also that there are a lot of difficulties for union to protect 
adequately workers targeted by these inequitable measures. Uh, there's another stream of literature uh, that is looking also at labor precarization uh, that is based on the labor uh, market segmentation theory. Basically, there is a, a, a segmentation uh, between workers in the primary uh, market with, with we can, we can uh, say, good jobs, and those in the sec uh, secondary, uh, secondary market, the, uh, or, or someone could say the outsiders. Uh, what we observe also, it's not the segmentation uh, is also applied uh, within the primary sector between uh, new, for instance, between new hiring, uh, new hired people and the, uh, uh, the uh, more senior workers. We are looking at different forms of inequities. We, def we, we define inequity as any form any difference in treatment relating to employment and working condition, of course, any difference in treatment that favors one group of workers over another group of workers performing the same task. So there are different forms of, of inequity between co-workers and peripheral workers, senior employees, new uh, hired employees, civil servant, new employees of former public uh, companies and so forth. So, our focus in equity and treatment between different group of employee, it goes a bit beyond. It includes, but it goes beyond discrimination for illegal motives and such as gender, uh, age, or race. The methodology of the, this research project, um, the, 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 the first question that comes uh, always in mind when you have a comparative study is why these countries, beside you, you like to travel to these countries. Uh, uh, we wanted a, a different type of uh, capitalism. Uh, uh, of course, uh, France and, and, and Denmark are more, are more like coordinated market economies. Australia and Quebec are more uh, liberal market economies. There are also different, uh, we wanted a variety of industrial relations systems. Uh, these, uh, the industrial relations system in these countries uh, is uh, quite different. There are some kind of uh, varieties regarding the union uh, density rates, uh, the role given to company level bargaining, but also even regarding equity uh, at work. Uh, we use a, a, a Kim uh, and et al. Uh, classification, uh, which say that the, the Australian and, and industrial relations system favor economic profit or effectiveness over social well-being, the equity uh, dimension, whereas the Danish system gives equal importance to both criteria and the French system give uh, more, a moderate priority to equity and no priority to effectiveness. So you, you have these varied uh, 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 countries. There has been field work conducted uh, at the national sectoral and firm level in each country. Uh, of course, we have document, we, 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 um, we perform some documentary analysis. Uh, focus group with national and sectoral uh, union and HR representative were conducted. Interviews with management representative uh, in labor relation union uh, representative and, wor and workers concern uh, were uh, also uh, interviewed. So uh, total, uh, there is a total, there was a, a total of 105 people that were interviewed individually or in focus group in the four country. And in Australia, Canada, and France, this field work was partly conducted uh, with by researchers from two different countries, bringing to bear the advantages of familiarity and distance. So each presentation will present the national illustrative example uh, following more or less this broad structure. They will present the industrial, the industrial relations system, the nature and form of inequity uh, study, 
explanation of the existence of the inequity, including the collective bargaining dynamics and social partners response and the implication. So uh, I think we'll start with, with Ruth. Uh, that she was the first online, so I will stop this. All right, Ruth. There we go. I'm unmuted now, so we should be <clears throat> all a bit better. Okay, um, just start off and um, people are often unfamiliar where Tasmania is. So I'll just start off with a little map of Tasmania and you can see there um, that's an island to the south of uh, Australia and it's, I think, got about 500,000 people live in um, Tasmania. So. The two um, plants that um, I've looked at are, are, are part of Simplot, which is a US uh, multinational. Um, so they're, one's located at Olveston, which you can see on the little map there, and um, Olveston's got about 10,000 people. And the second one is at uh, Devonport. And there's, I think about, it takes probably 20 minutes to um, by car between the two um, towns. So they are quite uh, close together. Um, so you can see there some of the um, statistics about them. Um, the Northwest Coast is quite disadvantaged, so they are quite big employers and the um, workers there are seen as being um, quite well paid. Um, or when it comes to the um, fair the Australian industrial legislation, what we have basically is a federal system and it has a series of, of tiers. At the bottom are um, 10 national employment standards and that includes a minimum wage, it includes things such as um, unpaid parental leave, um, I think things like sick leave, um, a, whole, a whole lot of things like that and the rest of them I can't remember because it's late at night. Um, and above, sitting above that are, are what are called awards and they are um, cover um, industries or occupations, um, generally um, more likely industries. So there'll be one for hospitality and retail, there'd be one for manufacturing, um, there'd be one for telecommunications, um, there might be one for printing and so on. Um, so um, if so, they uh, sit above the the national employment standards. So um, where what where an award is what's called silent, then um, the conditions that cover that particular worker are in the national employment standards. Now, sitting above the awards are what are enterprise agreements, and that's what Simplot has between um, the main union there or the only union there called the. Um, AMWU, which is the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union. Um, there's three types of um, uh, enterprise agreements and I, I, in a sense, bring that to your attention because uh, there are collective agreements that can be uh, non-union and that sometimes play, that places pressure on the union because if the union can't reach agreement, then uh, the employer can go out and have a vote of, um, of all, all the uh, employees in the factory or in the workplace and can have a non-union agreement uh, certified. Um, so um, the Fair Work Act doesn't, uh, I suppose over time the Australian industrial legislation has changed. It used to be a lot more emphasis on fairness, but now or over the last 20 or so years it's become to emphasise a lot more um, productivity and, and flexibility. So what it does is that it means that you can't, if you, if you are Simplot, you can't actually be part, part, you can't be the union and try and have a multi-employer um, agreement. It has to be just with Simplot and then you have to go and negotiate the next agreement with the next employer. 
Um, so that has restrictions and I suppose encourages um, competitiveness between employers. Uh, there's also significant limitations on industrial action about the ability to strike. Um, is quite an onerous process and can only occur once an agreement has expired and that matters in an agreement must pertain directly to the employment relationship. So you can't have um, matters in agreements such as limitations on casual employment or, for example, uh, agreements that the employer will deduct union fees. Um, the only, I suppose, uh, limitation on um, equality uh, is that there is uh, legislation about, for example, uh, equal employment opportunities, gender and disabilities, and an agreement can't uh, discriminate um, or have clauses in it that discriminate on the basis of those um, uh, aspects. So when bargaining proceeds, they have in Australia what's called good faith bargaining, and that means that the um, the parties must meet and they must um, table, I suppose, um, items. They must have discussions over them, but of course, they do not need to actually um, agree. So uh, you can have good faith bargaining and then, for example, the employer can say, well, we're going to, um, <clears throat> we don't think we're progressing fast enough. We're going to go out and have a ballot of the employees and try and conclude a uh, non-union um, agreement. So uh, a, an agreement doesn't need to be, uh, isn't endorsed just by union members. It has to be agreed on um, by 50% plus one of all employees. So um, the union um, needs to, I suppose, have solidarity amongst the whole um, workforce, not just the union um, members. Okay, so um, talking about um, the context with um, um, Simplot was that prior to the negotiation um, of their agreement in 2018, they were having particular troubles in their um, the vegetable processing. There was falling consumer demand, there was declining profits. Um, their volumes um, had fallen to 40,000 tonnes a year. And if you remember on the first slide, it said that it's now up to 83,000 tonnes um, of vegetables and they had antiquated machinery. So in particular, the vegetable processing factory was an issue um, for them. Um, so Simplot in its negotiations uh, took quite an aggressive stance against the union and what it wanted to do it's, was it wanted to have agreements for a number of sites. Uh, so it wanted to split off from a um, central agreement to one for um, each site. So they had a site at uh, one at, obviously they've got the two in Tasmania, so, that, so that's two sites. They had one I think in Kelso in New South Wales and there's also um, I think another small one in Bathurst in uh, New South Wales. So the union was quite, um, I suppose, um, didn't want this to happen because it saw it as splitting uh, its industrial um, strength, so fragmenting its, its bargaining power. And also what they wanted was to have no pay increase for the first year. So in effect, um, for the workers to have a real pay decrease. So after, I suppose, lack of progress, um, the AMW put on um, industrial action and Simplot countered with a media um, campaign. So we're in a deindustrialized region that's quite poor. And what they did was that they went out to the press and politicians um, and said, you know, these are greedy workers. Um, uh, they want um, they're endangering jobs in an area with no jobs and there was really quite a um, savage uh, media campaign and it quite it quite sort of dispirited um, the the union. So after a, a year um, long campaign they reached um, agreement. So 
what the union did was it managed to retain the single agreement um, and it managed to get some pay increases. So they were the um, improvements. But what, what the losses were, were changes to um, rosters. I think um, there were, um, and changes to starting times. So there were, um, I think, longer, longer shifts and also some changes to the shift um, structures. Um, but one of the inequities that was um, introduced was um, about permanent employees uh, who were hired between, before the, um, the 1st of December 2014. So that was, um, um, the, I suppose, the employees that were already employed, they had um, um, more generous redundancy, sorry, how many minutes? Five, okay. They had more generous redundancy pay, so they had four weeks pay plus four weeks pay for every year of service. So you could, it was in effect uncapped. Um, and permanent employees hired after um, that day, so people who were yet to be employed had a cap of in effect, um, what did it be? 12, 12 weeks, uh, 12 years service plus um, four weeks pay. So only up to 12 years of service were recognised. So they got a maximum of 52 weeks pay if they were made um, redundant. And I suppose um, this is in the context of an industry or of factories that had um, progressively through automation been um, retrenching workers over time. Um, so the membership, there was some ambivalence about it. So some of, some of the members thought, well, what we've managed to do by this in effect is all of us have, we've managed to retain our conditions, we've managed to um, it, retain our bargaining power, we've sort of done the best we can and avoided the worst options. Um, but others believed that it was a poor provision that, you know, it was not something a union should do would be to give away the, um, the conditions of, of, of future workers. Um, they went into the next bargaining round, which was the bargaining round from 2018 to 21, or the, for the, the, the next agreement, and they wanted to try and um, have that reversed, but they were unable um, to do so. So it will be interesting, I suppose, um, to see what will, will happen because, um, and particularly with the coronavirus, um, Simplot's finding that their demand for frozen vegetables and potato chips uh, of is, um, it, it, well, is generally there, um, in particularly a vegetable factory um, is, is um, producing a, well, it's going to capacity, basically. They, they haven't got enough capacity for all the um, vegetables. And as well, they've switched from importing vegetables from um, China because of concerns over um, product quality. Um, there's been, um, what do you call it, doctoring or adulteration of um, Chinese um, products. So there's also been government investment. So um, things are looking good for... Um, Simplot, so it will be interesting in um, a very different environment uh, to see how the uh, negotiations go next time with the agreement expiring in um, a year. So um, I think that's all from me at this stage. Okay. All right, Ruth. Right on Thanks. time. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, now, uh, if you are okay with that, uh, we'll go with the, uh, the um, our da Danish uh, colleague, uh, Anna Einstein. Okay, I'll try to... Thanks. Can you make the screen shared? I guess you're the the host, or should I do it?
you can do it. Uh, you will have full control on your. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, on your uh, PowerPoint. Okay. Uh, you will be able to do it. Okay. Um. Does it work now? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you very much. So thank you for this invitation to present the Danish uh, case, which I've been uh, doing uh, the last couple of years together with my colleagues Steen Nauerbjerg and Trine Larsen. Um, so collective bargaining system and the Danish model is a bit unlike the Australian one. So I'll just uh, in the beginning here, uh, briefly introduce how it looks in Denmark. So in general, uh, the Danish industrial relations model is highly voluntaristic. And what does that mean? That means is that most uh, wages and working conditions in Denmark are regulated through agreements uh, negotiated uh, between member-based organizations. So it's very much bottom up and it's very industry oriented who wants to join organizations, unions and employers organizations, and which kind of uh, industry agreements do they negotiate. And also this is backed up by quite high union densities and a quite high, at least comparatively, collective agreement uh, coverage and coverage by shop stewards. And on top of that, I can add also a quite high organization of employers in employers associations. So this to say that uh, at least compared to the Australian case, legislation plays a quite uh, limited role in, in Denmark and also the federal level. Politicians, they stay out of the industrial relations system as, most, um, as, as much as they can. Uh, and most of it is uh, regulated via collective agreements. So this is it's very important to understand the Danish system. So even even for those on the outskirts of the labor market, the main way you regulate wages is via collective agreements. However, what we have seen in, in later years, and I think we are not the only one, is a, a rise in the atypical employment. People who are hired on other conditions than the permanent full-time job. And these groups are at greater risk of being excluded from the Danish model and the wage and working conditions negotiated by the social partners. And uh, we both see a light increase in the overall level of atypical employment. It's almost a third now in total of the labor force hired on uh, atypical conditions, but we also see some certain forms of atypical employment uh, on the increase. And I just, brought you one uh, figure here just to show you um, what the recent trends are. And, and you can see the top curve, the blue one is part-time employment. That's the type of atypical employment, mostly on the increase in Denmark. And it's mainly due to the red curve you can see a bit more below, um, which is marginal part-time employment, less than 15 hours per week. And currently in other projects, we are actually looking into whether this is in real life is zero hour contracts. Pe people with no guaranteed hours, but working uh, up to 15 hours per week. So we have a phenomena here, which is uh, interesting. We also see that in, in other countries like Ireland and some of the other Nordic countries. So this is kind of interesting. However, we also have other atypical forms of employment. We have uh, a bit less than 10% on uh, fixed term contracts. And we also have about 5% uh, of solo self-employment. Temporary agency work is quite uh, limited in Denmark. It's around 1% of the workforce. So how does this unfold? More atypical workers, especially certain type of atypical work, and this voluntarist model where wages and working conditions mainly 
is regulated by collective agreement. There's very little follow-up legislation to protect against discrimination and so on and vulnerable groups. How does that unfold? Well, there are uh, three types of institutionally embedded inequalities that we have located in our uh, work here, both desk research and field work. One is a uh, lack of representativeness. Um, first of all, atypical workers are less likely to be union members and to be covered by collective agreements. And uh, one of the reasons to this is that uh, being a union member in Denmark is quite expensive and, and we m in most unions have a flat rate. So you don't get, get any discounts if you're an atypical workers. Uh, and what uh, the, the, the largest union we have for unskilled workers is actually the most Im uh, expensive union <laughs> that we have. And, and that's uh, kind of contradictory, you could say, but it's, uh, it's a challenge. Another type of uh, institutional embedded inequality is um, collective agreements and how they uh, built uh, eligibility criteria to certain uh, aspects. First of all, you could see that many of the um, social benefits we have in our collective agreements, they are built around the notion of full-time open-ended contracts. So it can be difficult, even if you're covered, to be eligible as, uh, eligible as an atypical workers. And even though we have some changes from the EU, which is mostly legislation based, um, we still see some challenges because these eligibility criteria are quite, uh, rather restrictive, uh, for instance, based on seniority and other criteria. Also, and I think all of us here in the room, we know about this process of increased decent decentralization of collective bargaining. And this also includes a risk of in increased diversity at the local level. The opposite hypothesis could be quite as true, but we can see that some of these uh, atypical workers are vulnerable groups in the process of decentralization. So what do the social partners do? Um, they have different uh, they have different things, uh, responses that they, they, they try to deal with this challenge with the atypical workers. One thing they've tried to do is to expand the coverage of collective agreements to cover atypical workers and new companies. Uh, to a larger degree include temporary agency workers, part-time workers and so on. Um, and the EU directives, which is interesting given we have a voluntarist model, is a driving force here, which is quite interesting. We also see types of labor clauses, um, certification schemes. So even though we do not have extension of collective agreements by legislation in Denmark, actually most social partners in Denmark, they really try to avoid that and don't like that. You can see that happening behind uh, the scene through these labor clauses, especially in the public sector where it says, okay, to win this bid, you have to have orderly wages and working conditions. So there are some interesting developments here. Also, social partners have tried to increase union density through various campaigns. They tried to work on the thresholds of these eligibility criteria I talked about before, and also include specific rights for some atypical workers. We uh, investigated this through some field work, both targeting uh, the social partners via interviews uh, in the manufacturing and food industry in Denmark, but also through uh, nine case companies that we studied and talked to shop stewards, employees and managers the last couple of years. And I'm just giving you a brief uh, sketch of some of the results here. We were looking at uh, kind of best cases because they were all covered by collective agreements, had a high union density and a strong tradition for workplace representation. But as expected, we found some challenges with regards to the atypical workers, um, especially temporary agency workers, maybe no surprise, but it's more difficult for them to enter some of the representative organs and, and, and receive representativeness, also through processes of local bargaining. We also see, especially in manufacturing, the use, uh, a rising number of uh, external consultants are used 
uh, white collar workers are increasingly subcontracted or hired in as external consultants. And these groups are not covered by collective agreements. They have individual negotiations. Uh, across the line, we see subcontracted work as a strategy, um, but especially in manufacturing. And it's a part of a trend of outsourcing. Um, and of course, these groups are not covered by the company agreement. So if that, they are in atypical terms, it's also a challenge. And I just want to, uh, if I have time, Patrice, to bring just one quote um, in, because there are some, I think we all know a large dilemmas in this because insiders and outsiders at company level uh, through local processes of bargaining, they look at each other, are you a competitor or what? So uh, we think it's very interesting this uh, perspective from the insiders, whether they see the uh, atypical workers as a challenge, as a competitor or not. And I just have a quote here from one of the companies from a shop steward who says, Temporary agency workers have to have our wages and they are not allowed to be wage dumpers. So on one hand, they want them to integrate. They want them to have the same wage so they don't threaten the insiders. Um, however, they also want to keep them at a distance because the quote follows here. Temporary agency workers are an emergency measure and they will never be one of the team. And I think this is a, an inherent dilemma that we meet in a lot of company level studies on temporary agency workers and other forms of atypical work. So there are some mechanisms of inclusion because you don't want wage competition. On the other hand, you don't want them to bring them so close that they threaten your job. So it's, it's a, an inherent dilemma uh, in, in these mechanisms of uh, inequality and inequ inequity at the company level when we talk about local negotiations and, and atypical work. So thank you for your attention and we look forward for, uh, to questions. All right. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Anna. Now we will move to, to France with, with Camille and Elodie. Camille will present. Yes, okay, I, I try to share my, uh, my screen. Um, okay, I, I have to, to print the... Um, I'm not sure I can share my... Uh, my screen. En fait, il y a partager écran en bas. Oui, mais en fait, ça, en fait, ça me demande de quitter la réunion euh, avant de pouvoir le faire. Um, Je vais bon. essayer. C'est bon. Parfait. Alors, hop. Est-ce que c'est bon Oui. Ok, et je peux le mettre en plein écran Ou vous pouvez juste mettre en plein écran en bas. Vous avez l'option... Okay, thank you. Um, okay, so uh, I am going to present you the, the French, um, French cases. Um, well, I, I will begin by a very short presentation of the French industrial relations system. Uh, the principal features uh, are a high degree of state involvement, a three-tier system of regulation, a strong tradition of multi-unionism and low unionization rates, and uh, a dual channel system of employee representation at workplace level. Uh, since 1980s, uh, in France, there is a growing trend to decentralize collective bargaining at the workplace level. Uh, then the, the locus of collective bargaining has shifted from the traditional level of industry uh, to that of companies and more places. This evolution is based on the assumption in, in France that companies are the most relevant level of uh, social regulation. Thus, negotiations now tend to be decentralized with company level bargaining gaining new ground. Uh, there is a lot of, um, uh, of issues uh, in, for them. Compulsory, uh, there is a compulsory bargaining at company level. Uh, like um, uh, equal rights for men and women, health benefits, etc. 
Thus, the trend is a clear intensification of company level collective bargaining, but it's not a generalization of collective bargaining to whole companies. Uh, it's uh, mainly in medium and large companies, but it remains weak in SMEs where unions are not present. Um, okay, now I, I, I will present the position of the friends about uh, the principle of, e of equal or unequal treatment. Uh, we, we believe in, in this project that law matters, so uh, we, 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 we took at, uh, attention to that. Uh, in France, since 1966, the Labour Code has included the rule of equal pay for equal work, and uh, this rule was relabeled the principle of equal treatment in uh, 2008. Uh, it can be defined as uh, follows uh, one of our interviewees have, um, if you are doing the same work in the same position, your pay or other work or, or employment condition should be the same. So the, the principle is really simple. If unequal treatment between workers exists, the difference has to be justified by different positions in the workplace. In such a case, the treatment is considered unequal but not discriminatory. However, in some cases, unequal treatment can overlap with discriminatory practices if the category of people suffering from the unequal treatment is precisely a category that the law protects, such as uh, women, older workers, immigrant workers, etc. Uh, in France, there is a set of situations in which employees holding similar position in the same workplace are subject to different employment and working conditions. Uh, so, to study how the issue of inequality at work is understood by French social actors, uh, Elodie and I and, um, and Patrice, um, uh, for some of them, uh, we have uh, interviewed the members of, of uh, three French trade unions, uh, La CGT, CFDT et Solidaire. Uh, all of these members uh, were or had previously been worker representatives in specific companies. And most of them know our responsibilities at the sectoral or, or central level in their respective unions. Uh, on the employer side, we interviewed uh, senior HR managers from multinational companies. Uh, and well, these interviews allow us to understand uh, how we understand here inequality at work, but also to identify in-depth case studies. In addition to these interviews, we looked closely at the legal literature and at court cases uh, to understand um, the legal framework, but also the legal debates relating uh, inequality at work in France. Uh, so um, thanks to this fieldwork, we have uh, identified several cases of inequalities of treatment at workplace level. Uh, here, uh, we propose to, to focus on situations in which employees perform the same task for the same employer. So it's, it's a same employer, it's, it's important. Uh, but so they, they have different employment or work conditions because they have different employment contracts. So here, we do not include uh, cases which also exist in, in France, like, like in, in Denmark, for example. Uh, where the employees performing the same tax but have different employers, such as employers of contractors and subcontractors, uh, for example. Uh, so here we want to, to focus on two examples. Uh, first one is uh, cases when differences between pre uh, are between previously hired and more recently hired employees of public companies. Uh, in France, employees of public companies are subject to really specific employment and, work on, uh, and working conditions related to their status as civil servants or public sector's employee. Some of these uh, public, uh, public companies have recently hired employees outside uh, this uh, traditional status on the basis of private employment contracts. Consequently, employees holding the same position can work side by side, but have different status. The differences between the two categories of employees mentioned during our interviews relate mainly to pay scales. 
but can also relate to health insurance or leave. Or, or, uh, yes, or leave. Uh, this is, for example, the case in uh, postal and telecommunication services, and uh, for example, also uh, at uh, the uh, national uh, railway company. Uh, the second example we want to we want to focus on is uh, differences between employees initially from different companies, uh, but uh, who are working together at a merger or buyout of the different companies. Uh, merger and acquisition bring together companies with different background and cultures, of course, but also covered by different collective agreements at sectoral or at workplace level. Uh, legally, if in France, if a, a, a company buys another company, it must ensure that employees who are transferred from, uh, from the company continue to be covered by the initial collective agreements. So we can have employees who work together in the new entity, but who are covered by different sectoral or um, company level collective agreements. Uh, we have, for example, this case, this case um, uh, in, a, in a, a firm called Chemical. Uh, it's a foreign chemical company and it merged with a French company uh, of the same size. Uh, we called it uh, Chimie. And some elements differentiating the employment and working condition between the two, um, uh, the two different companies have been progressively integrated. But other differences are still at play. Uh, for example, job classification or pay scales are different uh, uh, if uh, uh, you, you were uh, hired by uh, one or the other run the company. Um, we tried to uh, replace those cases uh, in the matrix presented by Patrice, uh, which is uh, the uh, our matrix to, uh, to, to understand uh, our cases in this project. Uh, in our cases, we can see that we have a starting point with groups of employees with different employment and working conditions. Uh, it is what we call the segmentation. Indeed, in our different cases, the difference is not the result of the collective bargaining. Uh, for example, in the public companies, uh, they have been partially or fully privatized as ordered by the state. Um, and the European Union with the aim of uh, promoting uh, economic competition. Consequently, employees holding the same, the same position can not side by side and yet all different public versus private statuses, but it's not the result of the collective bargaining. Uh, what we want to understand is uh, in this situation, uh, what collective bargaining can lead uh, to reduce or to maintain those differences. Um, okay, we, we, we can now um, uh, analyze the, so, the social partner strategies. So in our field, in our field work, uh, we see that both unions and employers expressed that the existence of inequities can create tensions between and within uh, different groups of employees. In the case of uh, mergers in particular, cooperation between different group of workers can be difficult given their diverging backgrounds. Uh, they also underline how complex it can be to compare the situations of different group of workers. Indeed, uh, some might enjoy certain advantages while experiencing drawbacks related to other elements. Uh, in this context, unions face difficulties taking divergent interests into account, especially during uh, compulsory bargaining runs for workers who, have, who are covered by different uh, industry level collective agreements, for example. Uh, the union representatives also explain that employees are not easy to convince to or mobilize when they are not directly concerned by the issue at stake. Uh, just to, 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 to finish, um, we, we, uh, we want to, uh, to explain employer strategies and union, and union strategies. Employer strategies vary from one case to another. Some employers are in favor of harmonizing employee conditions. For example, it was uh, the case for chemical after its merger with, uh, with Kimi. 
the employer representatives and unions worked together uh, to, uh, to define uh, new conditions um, uh, for, for, for all the um, all workers. Uh, in some of other cases, uh, the employers were in favor of maintaining the different systems. It's the case, for example, in um, the telecom uh, company. Um, the, the employer uh, chose to maintain the differences uh, in status, but since the privatization of the company, they try to reduce particularism, but we still have different status. Uh, and the, the reduction of particularism is not full. Uh, for unions, uh, unions defend the principle that inequities should, should be reduced or, um, or completely um, uh, avoided. Uh, so they, they, they demand the harmonization of employee, of employee conditions, but they want to highlight employee conditions uh, with the best ones. Uh, it's, for example, the case in the, in the, uh, in the railway case where they try to, uh, to find a way to, uh, to have a better condition for all, uh, all workers. Okay, so I, I stop here. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, thank you, uh, Camille. Uh, we will follow up. Uh, I will follow up uh, with my colleague, uh, Melanie Laroche. Uh, I don't know if she's online. I don't see her at this point. <laughs> ah, Lila. Okay. Excuse. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm going to share. I'm going to share a, 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 the screen. Is it working? Yes. Okay. So. So I'll start with the Quebec, uh, with the presentation of Quebec National uh, Industrial uh, Relations System. Um, for those uh, of you who are not aware, in Canada, the responsibility of industrial relation is, uh, is shared among the federal, provincial, and territorial government, such, as, uh, such that each jurisdiction has its own autonomous industrial relations system. Consequently, uh, although, although these systems tend to share similarities, uh, there is no such thing as a unified Canadian industrial relations system. So we just choose to focus on the situation uh, on the industrial relations system in Quebec. Uh, of course, the, uh, the, the different Canadian industrial, uh, the, the industrial relations systems in other provinces and territories are quite, are quite similar to the, and even in the federal jurisdiction are quite similar to those, to the, the one uh, in effect in, in, in Quebec. Um, which uh, industrial relations system is mainly based on the uh, uh, U.S. Wagner Act uh, with, with grassroots uh, union recognition, union monopoly of representation, and of course decentralized uh, collective bargaining. So it, it was, uh, I think, I think it, it was conceived and conceptualized as being decentralized at the beginning. It's, it's there's no, not a lot of uh, big ten tendency, to, big trend towards decentralization, it's already uh, quite decentralized. Uh, one union uh, exclusively represents all employers. This is the, uh, the uh, union monopoly. Uh, <coughs> the object of the negotiation uh, is relatively vast. Uh, a few years ago, we used to call that the, the, the law of the party. Uh, so the, the uh, which means that they can conclude a collective agreement about anything uh, except uh, the uh, illegal for uh, illegal uh, matters, uh, and and uh, w one quite important principle is the freedom to bargain, which which implies that the parties are free to include in their collective agreement uh, any measure on which they mutually agree, uh, and of course this. Could, this is uh, one of the reasons which uh, led uh, to the appearance of two chief wage or compensation provision uh, of other form of inequity in these 
in uh, collective agreements in, in Quebec. So the, 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 the example of uh, inequity in you know, I said setting that we 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 have chosen we have chosen is the two chip provision, uh, or in 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 the law in Quebec we call that the difference in treatment, uh, which grant uh, an employee solely on the basis uh, on his or her hiring date or less advantageous working condition that than that which is uh, granted to other employees performing the same task in the same establishment. This uh, this provision can have a permanent effect or a temporary effect. A permanent effect uh, is when the uh, new hire cannot catch up with the um, uh, with, with the uh, the senior workers uh, regarding salaries or benefits uh, also and so forth. Of course, the classic uh, two chair provision uh, is focusing on, on salaries and, and wage structures and, and so forth, but it's not only a salary uh, issue. It's benefits. Uh, um, it concerns also benefits, employment status, pension plan, work schedule, and so forth. Um, these uh, <clears throat> provision uh, are observed in one in seven agreements and uh, uh, one in seven agreement in, in, in Quebec. Uh, these uh, provisions are found more in the private sector than in the public sector, but uh, one sector where the, the the sector where we find the most uh, the, the greatest number of these of these provisions are in trade, uh, retail and also wholesale trade. So uh, Melanie will present to you uh, the motives and uh, the justification. Uh, that uh, were given to us uh, by the parties that we interview and uh, the, uh, during interviews and also focus group. Uh, we conducted uh, some focus group uh, with uh, Camille and Elodie. So, Melanie? Thank you. Do you hear me? Yeah. Ça Question one to us is deliberate to agree and in 15 perspective agreement in Port in Quebec. Our field work revealed that the difference of treatment clauses have often appeared as a uh, to avoid location, plan closure, etc. And the provision was proposed by management during our negotiation uh, aim at reducing costs and increasing flexibility in compensation or job security in response to competition and economic uncertainty at sectoral or company level. Uh, employers are in favor of this period treatment clause because they make it possible to impose uh, the cost of concession on workers who are not yet hired. So, they achieve their rationalization objective while minimizing conflict in, uh, in plant. Uh, of course, at the national level, unions work clearly against uh, the TT provision system. Um, this provision was a major break, uh, in fact, with the principle of equity and create discrimination among union members. But in practice, however, uh, some local unions agree to them. And why the <laughs> union feel at this moment that they were avoiding the worst, uh, they have responded to the employer's demand for concession while uh, maintaining the benefits of the member they have represented for many years. And how can we explain that? Uh, there's two major causes. In fact, the first one is the lack of power for unions. Uh, some unions have been unable to avoid these provisions, and in fact, other concessions have also been accepted by the union at the same time as the tier provision system. And there's also a lack of solidarity be between current members and those yet uh, to be hired. Starting for people that you don't know, it's not an easy thing, it's a difficult exercise. A, and at the same time, the orphans are not present in the, in the union meetings. 
uh, to defer, defend their own interests. So the capacity of union to resist to such inequality or inequity uh, is in fact very weak. And um, the dynamics of this case clearly appear to be oriented toward uh, and the maintenance of inequity uh, as uh, that was presented uh, in the matrix earlier. And let me present you the specific context of the Quebec uh, system uh, regarding the two-tier wage system. Uh, this is called the disparity of treatment or difference in treatment. So in 1999, uh, given the growth present of these provisions in the collective agreement, and because of the pressure of some, some uh, youth group, uh, I was one of them <laughs> in unions, uh, the government of Quebec prohibits um, two-tier provision with permanent effect on the limited number of working conditions. I think Patrice uh, mentioned some of them. So you can see wage duration of work days, leaves of absence, tools for any travel expenses. However, uh, temporary disparity and those not prohibited in the list uh, continue to be created and maintained in local systems. So, in response to this development, and particularly with respect to the complementary benefits such as pension and group insurance, the government once again intervened almost 20 years later in uh, 2018. What is interesting in this case, it is not so much the effectiveness of, of collective bargaining, because after all, uh, although 85% of collective arguments uh, do not include such provisions, uh, but it's uh, the legal constraints introduced as a result of the institution's inability to prevent introduction and perpetuation of uh, uh, disparity of treatment clauses. That may explain the action and even appearance in the future. Um, what are the main implications of uh, these clauses? We have obviously seen uh, negative effects for both parties that are attributable to this type of clause. Uh, we can see equity issues, intergenerational divisions. Uh, a conflictly, a conflicting uh, work climate, reduced commitment to organization and to union. Uh, so these provision, these provisions, therefore, appear to be a short-term solution. In, in the long term, they cannot be used as a solution to meet the objective of profitability or flexibility. Um, profitable solution uh, must be found, and this is what the social partner. Uh, mentioned during uh, the interviews. Another question raised by our result, the extent to which legislation can be a solution to the, prob uh, the, the problem of these inequities. In Quebec, uh, for example, the parties first focused on wage difference and then there are two types of difference involving other conditions. So even the partial ban of 1999 did not prevent other forms of differences from continuing to develop. The recent uh, expansion of prohibited funds does, does not affect some form of difference according to the statutes of some instance, for example, which still leaves the possibility for the party to circumvent uh, the law as before. So while, while equity is an important principle in our society, differences in treatment must be prohibited regardless of their and finally, what should we learn uh, from uh, the, uh, the Quebec case? Um, first of all, uh, orphans are clearly internal, uh, internal outsider. They do exactly the same work for less advantageous working conditions. We, we also observe two, uh, two kinds of effect. Um, the first one can be considered as a maturing effect uh, because if at the beginning, unions certainly wanted to avoid the worst by adopting difference uh, in treatment clauses. Um, after a few years, they experienced significant problems in maintaining solidarity among members. And orphans now form the majority groups in several of the unit concerned uh, by uh, this kind of clause. And debates that did not take place 
uh, 20 years ago uh, be held. And alter, uh, alter the tide years later, it's not an easy thing. And it's a major problem in several units. In, the case, in response to competition and economic uncertainty case, we also observed a partial ban in, uh, of 1999, led the party to experiment with other forms of inequities and negotiate them. The union uh, employers are not being uh, able to stop the adoption of these clauses at local level. Uh, and in fact, uh, labor dispute related to disparity of treatment clauses in pensions, for example, is very long, very long, very costly for, for the parties. So now unions have once again formed alliances with pressure groups and have once again called for government in this version, and we had that in, 19, in 2018. In that case, we also, uh, we also observed that institutional complementary is essential. In decentralized bargaining system, these institutions need to be supported uh, by the legislation. Law can certainly prevent the parties from using their freedom to bargain and to establish different working conditions for a specific group. But the differences in treatment are perhaps a phantom of a deeper problem, uh, the problem of imbalance of power in a decentralized bargaining system that make it more difficult for unions uh, to fight the unique. Uh, so this is for me. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Mel Melanie. We experienced uh, so, so some problem with during we, we had difficulty to to hear you a bit so uh, okay all right now we are at the uh, Q&A uh, question uh, period uh, we have more or less 20 minutes I suggest to uh, use uh, the uh, the chat or you can go also uh, orally if you pray if you want to pop up and ask your question uh, I propose to have uh, a couple of questions or maybe a little more and we'll start to answer after that. So who wants to ask a question? I don't know if everyone is writing on the on the chat. Steve. Yeah, well, just to kick off a discussion, I, I think one of the things that could be interesting to discuss now, our study has basically be, be, been be, before Corona. Um, there are some new issues coming up about inequity during Corona, and and I and and I discussed it just briefly this morning actually, that there is something happening at right now with the Corona where. Some people might be excluded from the labor market, uh, the, the more people are working at home and stuff like that. I, I know it's not directly related to our, our uh, study right now, but, but um, just to kick it off a little bit, that we, we could take that into consideration as well. Um, as Anna also, also mentioned, there might be some people that actually could work better in a corona setting where they have to work home when they are, you know, if you're introvert and don't like to be with other people and stuff like that. All I'm saying here and all I'm addressing here right now is I think there's a study that could be interesting to look further into. I know it's a little bit outside the scope, which is about how Corona is affecting equity at the labor market. Also about being trained at the labor market. Uh, we all know that you do get a driving license, but you don't know how to drive a car before you actually try it, right? Same thing is about work. You might get an education. You don't know how to use the education before you come on the labor market. And suddenly we have a new situation where people might work a lot at home and stuff like that. Um, just a consideration about inequity, um, maybe far away from what we talk about, but now I'll kick something off. All right, thank you, Steve. Hannah, you want to jump on this? So uh, just to follow up on Steen, we actually got the uh, funds for studying the effects of typical and atypical workers of the Corona crisis and all the government aid packages. And one thing uh, that came to mind just from the initial results we have from service and so on is that company size matters a lot. And I think also for our study here on uh, company level bargaining and inequity, 
I got the reflection that company size matters a lot here. And it seems that um, larger companies have a, com a different capacity for solving some of these issues that smaller companies. Uh, and I, I'm, I don't remember how much we reflected upon that in our work. And I was just thinking about it because uh, we can see now, at least in Denmark, that those government aid packages that targeted the well-covered uh, large companies with standard workers um, are much more efficient than the, the, the attempts made to help uh, small and medium-sized enterprises and uh, self-employed uh, various forms of atypical work. So um, it was just a reflection on, on and also from you know, the other project partners here, how company size interacts with this, these mechanisms of collective bargaining and, and inequity. Good question. We have a, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Elodie would like. Uh, yeah, just to answer Anna and Steen's uh, suggestions. Um, obviously, I think you're absolutely right that uh, the size of the company is a very important element here. And that um, we could also say that uh, the larger the company is, the greater the, the, the risk of having different situations between different groups of workers uh, is as well. So uh, I think it's an important element to take into account, but it would probably uh, be playing in both uh, circumstances, like uh, having more facilities or more uh, possibilities for the companies to find ways to reduce these inequities, but also maybe uh, the, 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 the changes or the risks that the uh, um, unequal treatments uh, uh, are at play would be greater uh, in the biggest uh, companies as well. So I think it's probably something that we should uh, keep on uh, thinking about. And uh, to answer Steen, uh, I don't think this is um, really uh, totally different from what we uh, what we tried to study, uh, including the coronavirus uh, uh, situation, because uh, as uh, Patrice said at the very beginning of the presentations, uh, our common uh, collective choice was to look at equity in a very broad sense. So equity and inequity in a very pretty broad sense. So um, considering that, uh, I think that uh, any situation which brings new uh, elements of inequities or unequal treatment is important for us considering the broad scope that was the one uh, that we wanted to include in the, in the study. Now, Grigal, you, uh, you want to, to intervene on that? Uh, well, if I can ask a, a question which um, might be too too general, uh, uh, but I'm I'm interested in what we can learn from your project. Uh, the way I see it is, you have a kind of continuum um, uh, where, at the one end, collective bargaining and the practitioners of collective bargaining are the heroic defenders of of equity and equality, um, and at the other end of the continuum. Uh, collective bargainers and uh, are the generators of inequity. Um, and uh, beyond the perception of this, I'm wondering if in what you've seen, there's anything that moves the dial, uh, be it uh, macro institutional factors, um, Denmark style, or uh, micro uh, factors, uh, and what we can learn from this, because clearly this is the the strategic dilemma for many union organizations that have a self-perception that they are the heroic defenders of, of equity, uh, and yet you have people covered by the collective bargaining and then people not covered by the collective bargaining who might often have different perspectives, and this makes them vulnerable. So is there anything that you can draw? And I I'm so, apologize, apologize that it's, it's, it's a wide sweep question, but nonetheless, I think I think it's a it's a, a relevant one for the work that you're doing and and you have things that you can bring to the table on on this and if you, it's not today it can be another time that we can talk about this. Sting, would you like to answer? Well, I'll start uh, in micro level uh, to answer that question because it has an, a relevance to the macro level. But we have seen in our studies as well that the solidarity between fixed workers for workers who already have a, a fixed employment 
with the workers who are temporary agency workers is very limited to say it's a, to say it mildly even in the Danish system where the coverage is pretty strong when you're unemployed and so forth right because the temporary workers is threatening a little bit the the, the stable work workforce in terms of might they be cheaper to use than the stable workforce and so forth right so so they they strive to integrate them but i would say the whole institutional setup also in the Danish system is basically made for a male about 43 years old with 1.8 kids and um, and basically working full time 37 hours if you don't fit that profile you might actually not fit very well into a to a union even in the Danish system which is considered quite well covering sorry i don't know if you get my irony here but um, uh, the the point is it doesn't encompass very well those who doesn't fit that system, who have 20 hours per week and so forth. I'm, I'm sure Anna has a couple of comments to that as well, if, if needed. Can I can I add something to this? So uh, I think this is a <laughs> very relevant question. And I think you have a different answer if you look at the micro level as Steen addressed and the macro level. So at the micro level, if you have a model like the Danish one with voluntarist system, the, the atypical workers are quite vulnerable. They are not very well defended by unions and um, other institutional factors um, because it's okay. I mean, it's legal that some are not covered by collective agreements or not well defended by unions because that's the system and we don't have much follow-up legislation. And the unions are quite expensive and they're pretty focused on their existing membership base. Um, so there's a lot of barriers of integrating these workers in the system. So I would completely agree with Steen at the micro level, this is very difficult to use a voluntarist model to uh, worker per worker per worker, integrate them and lift their wage and working conditions. At the macro level, maybe the answer is a bit different because what we can see in a, in a very organized vo voluntarist model like the Danish one is that the overall effect on wage and working conditions is pretty good and also have uh, spillover effects for some of these workers. So. Uh, we see some of the most vulnerable groups in Denmark, even if they are not covered by collective agreement, there's a kind of normative effect that helps push up the wages even for those who are not covered by collective agreement. So macro, macro wise, you could say there's a, a good effect. And even in companies where you have extension of collective agreement by legislation, maybe wages are not as high for the most vulnerable workers as in Denmark. So there's a kind of spillover effect, normative effect at the macro level, but at the single company, I completely agree with Steen. They're not very well represented. Uh, it's a, not an, an effective system for them at the local level. I hope that was a bit clear or, or, or was feeding into this uh, discussion. All right, is there anyone who would like to to continue to follow up on this one? Melanie, Elodie? It's just because we had a, a question in the chat box. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, uh, the question was about uh, any differences based on the racial uh, criteria. So I think that in our cases, uh, this is not something that we encountered directly speaking, by, meaning that since we were looking at collective agreements, which would tackle the, uh, uh, or create the situation of inequities or inequalities, um, the main criteria that we encountered were mostly uh, age or the, the, the date of recruitment, of hiring for the people or the employment status uh, regarding the situation within the company. So obviously then that can overlap with some uh, racial issues uh, for certain group of employees, but this was not at the core of the situation that we were looking at, considering that the collective bargaining uh, agreements themselves were not uh, based on this uh, criterion. It's just a very short answer. I'm sorry, I can't develop more. Yeah, if, in, if I may add, uh, uh, the, the, the type of difference in treatment that we, we, we were looking at are uh, an, an indirect source of discrimination 
for instance, uh, you, you can have atypical workers that are more racialized workers, and you can also have newly hired people that are more and more that, that comes from diversity. So uh, even though it's not directly uh, the, the, the focus of the, uh, of the study, these difference in treatment could indirectly lead to discrimination. Anyone who wants to, to add something on, on this, this question? Other question uh, on, the, on the chat? Oh, Diane, okay. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, okay, I answered the question. Okay, Diane's question. Any, any other question or comments on the, on the research or on this, this topic? Maybe if you if you if you if you want, I can just share with you some of the conclusions to which we we are coming regarding our uh, we, we are doing a, we're working on a paper right, right now and we have some conclusion. It's uh, 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 I would say maybe temporary uh, conclusion, but I would share these uh, with you. Just a sec. Okay. So we've, uh, we've seen that uh, there are uh, some kind of a variety of difference in treatment between the groups of, of workers. We, we, even though the, 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 our countries are, are quite diverse in terms of initial relations system and culture and so, so forth, we, find, we, we found uh, in each case uh, some inequities. In Canada and Australia, it was much more on hiring date and in France and Denmark, uh, the inequities were based more or less mo more on uh, workers' status. Uh, we've seen, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it relates to uh, Gregor's uh, question. Time seems to be, has to be considered when exam examining the, the uh, when we examine the dynamics of inequity of collective bargaining. What we've seen is that over time, uh, one process uh, creating, maintaining, reducing, or avoiding inequity depend, uh, depending of the condition of the moment. For example, why inequity still uh, could be a, a good idea at one moment in time, uh, inevitably it become uh, unacceptable over time leading to its reduction or even elimination. It's, uh, the, and you, you, you can see from the Canadian, Australian, and Danish, and Danish case that unions have sometimes ad adopted uh, one strategy, later replacing it with another as inequity r arose, albeit sometimes with difficulty mobilizing their the, the, the members. Uh, Melanie and Stein talk, uh, about, uh, raised the question of the solidarity. It's a, it's a main issue, uh, and I think it's a main um, way to prevent these inequalities uh, and uh, of course the, 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 these processes are, are not uh, mutually exclusive uh, of course the, the, the of, of course uh, this is putting uh, institution into question uh, so even in the presence of unions collective bargaining and collective agreement uh, one, one should not assume that all workers are treated equitably over time, these inequities appear to become the kind of a, a kind of a moral issue for the union, whether pressured by its member or by the social legal uh, context. So that's what, that's what we observe that could change uh, the the, strat the union strategy. However, some conditions such as uh, union bargaining power, solidarity, and new awareness of the problem appears to be necessary to to turn the tide. So, and so. Sometimes collective bargaining seems to be a cause of the emergence of inequities, and sometimes it's a solution preventing them. So, but we, we, what we learn is that uh, there are some uh, essential conditions to prevent inequities. Uh, one, law matters. Even though, like in Quebec, uh, the parties are able to, to go around the law 
uh, we think that it's quite important to, to uh, it helps union, it gives them some grip on, on, on the issue. The bargaining structure also seems quite important. Uh, when company level collective bargaining is subordinated to external factors of, such as sexual agreement, of course the risk of inequities are lower than when external constraints are minimal like in Canada and Australia. And Melanie and, uh, and the other mentioned also the, the institutional complementary then to fulfill its role to, and prevent inequities. Uh, uh, collective bargaining should be uh, uh, backed uh, back up and, uh, and supported to uh, in, in order to 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 attain its full uh, its full effect uh, by legal prohibition by the level also of negotiation. So these are the at this point the the findings that we we have regarding our uh, research um, i don't know if someone would like to 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 add something on this result uh, any questions or things that we haven't seen uh, at this point one two Three. This is it. So we still have four minutes. So thanks everyone for uh, uh, having attending this this session. It was quite uh, quite nice to see to see you all. Thank you. A special thank you for my my colleague uh, Ruth, <laughs> who is. I think it's midnight in, in, in Australia. It's in the middle of the night. So thank, thank, thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Steen, Hannah, Elodie, Camille, and, and, and uh, Melanie. So uh, see you in, a, in the next session. That will start, I think, uh, in a few minutes. So not, but, but not Ruth. She won't be there. So <laughs> thank you all. Thanks.